weld so that the weld may not be seen. So sang Akka Mahadevi, the great 12th century woman saint from southern India who composed her poems in Kannada along the river banks of Telangana and Sri Salem, regions which tell a remarkable tale of India's prowess as leaders in antiquity in pre-industrial iron and steel production. The songs of the Kamari blacksmiths of Telangana are fading and precious remnants of this once glorious legacy of the Hindu Vishwakarma community of craftspeople. In the Qutub Minar complex of Delhi stands the colossal iron pillar, the earliest known massive iron forging in the world of the 4th century Gupta period, which stands testimony to the mastery of ancient Indian iron and steel. In southern India, the tradition of iron working goes all the way back to the Iron Age or the megalithic period when spectacularly rich finds of iron implements are found from the Iron Age burials of Adi Chinalur in Tamil Nadu, dated to about 1000 BCE, housed in the Government Museum, Chennai. The southern Indian region of Telangana has a great syncretic legacy, having been ruled by impressive medieval kingdoms ranging from the Hindu Kakatiya dynasty at Warangal to the Mohammedan Sultanate of the Qutub Shahis of Golconda. Golconda was famed for the legendary wood steel, which was used to make the fabled Damascus steel blades which were prized in the Arab and Persian world for their exquisite watered pattern blades. The talisman by Sir Walter Scott fictionalized a 12th century encounter during the Crusades between the Christian and Islamic world during the truce between King Richard the Lionheart of England and Sultan Salauddin of Egypt, whereby the Sultan is said to have sliced a silk pillow with his smitar of Damascus steel of dull blue color marked by 10 millions of meandering lines, which is an apt description of the great pattern that the Damascus blades are so well known for. Mughal swords of Muslim rulers such as this may have been made of Golconda woods by blacksmiths and iron smelters of the Hindu Kamari communities who regarded themselves to be part of the Vishwakarma clan. One of the clearest accounts of crucible steel making from anywhere in the world is that of the Greco-Egyptian alchemist Zosimus in the 3rd century CE who mentioned that Indians melted iron in crucibles to make swords this indigenous knowledge was nurtured over centuries across various parts of India, including in Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and Telangana, as seen in the remnants of the memories of the Ukku Kamari of Telangana. In the low, I did a community loan and Nalu community loan and Jesaro, Okati, Ukku Panjas Nalu, Kamaru. Vishwakarma, who is revered in Vedic and Puranic lore, 
is regarded as the chief architect of the gods. Bridging the realms between myth and practice, he is a presiding deity of the artisanal community in many parts of India. Indeed, he is the maker of the world in the words of the anthropologist Jan Brouwer, who studied the Vishwakarma blacksmiths in Karnataka. Five artisanal groups claim allegiance to this sect, the blacksmiths, the bronze workers, the carpenters, sculptors and goldsmiths. At one time, blacksmiths enjoyed the highest status amongst the Vishwakarma and were known as the eldest. Not all blacksmiths in southern India, however, claim allegiance to the Vishwakarma sect. Blacksmithy is practiced all over southern India and blacksmiths are known by different names such as Kollan in Kerala, Karuman Vishwakarman in Tamil Nadu, Kamara in Karnataka and in Telangana both blacksmithy and the smelting of iron had been practiced. The blacksmiths were known as Kamari similar to the nomenclature in Karnataka and the iron smelters were known as Muddakamari, both of which were a prominent part of the Vishwakarma sect. The iron implements contributed to the agricultural prosperity of this region, which was also renowned for its mineral wealth and the diamonds of Golconda. The 13th century Venetian traveller Marco Polo spoke of the fame of the diamonds mined under the Kakatiya queen Rudrama Devi. This region is also rich in iron ore, banded ferruginous quartzite, the veins of which weave their way through the river beds of the Godavari. The Muttakamari iron smelters of the Telangana quite extensively smelted or reduced the iron ore to extract the iron, leaving behind huge heaps of debris known as slag. This activity of iron smelting has long ceased in the region though the community still survives. The smelted iron bloom were often used as raw material to make the famed high-grade wood steel or ukku. The word for steel in local languages recorded by travelers such as Voise in the 1800s. Tens of thousands of ingots of wood steel were shipped out of the Golconda region according to the 17th century traveller Tavernier. Whereas bloomery iron has a low carbon content of less than 0.04%, wood steel is basically steel of a high carbon content of around 1.5% carbon. Francis Buchanan in his travels in the Karnataka region in the early 1800s observed the making of wood steel by carburizing low carbon iron to get a high carbon content by packing it into crucibles with carbon rich matter and firing under highly reducing conditions at high temperatures of at least 1200 degrees centigrade. The term woods is a corruption of the word ukku which may relate to urukku which is the word for melting in several South Indian languages, including Tamil and Malayalam. The attempts to replicate and characterize woods by European scientists, such as Michael Faraday, in the 19th century, gave rise to several innovations. The study of wood steel also spurred several inventions of the Industrial Revolution by scientists such as Michael Faraday of alloy steels. The Indian crucible steel process was also replicated on a wider scale in Britain, for example through Huntsman steel. We are at Lakshmipur in northern Telangana and it's extraordinary that this hillock is actually not a hillock as such but it is a large mound of slag or archaeometallurgical debris from iron and steel production which has piled up over so many smelts, over so many uh, 
different smelting operations in time and built up into this hillock. And at the bottom you see the pieces of tap slag all collecting there. So there were many, many several hundreds of these kinds of hillocks dotting this landscape which have all been cleared away over time. We are in Kadem uh, Mandal Kalida village in Adilabad district. Kadem is very famous smelting site. Not only iron smelting sites but there are several crucible sites. Individual heaps you can count in the forest of the Kalida may, may go more than two to four thousand heaps. This is one of the big heap here in adjacent to the village in the forest. Now we found this two year which was used in iron smelting furnace. So here in fact what has been going on is that the smelting of bloomery iron has been going on whereby um, iron ore has been collected from the river and smelted or reduced at high temperatures mm. to form the solid iron bloom and we are looking at the debris or waste products from the smelting of the iron uh, blooms by the bloomery iron process. This is a tuyer which is a blow pipe which is used to blow um, wind into the furnace into the uh, sort of draft into the furnace for the smelting process to reduce the iron ore and what you're looking at here, this is a portion of the furnace walls, the lining of the furnace which is made of brick and other refractory material. And so these are various portions of the furnace walls which are broken here. And this is what we call slag in archaeometallurgical terms. Slag is the waste which forms as a sort of liquid on top of the bloomery iron and that collects, that collects all the impurities such as the quartz impurities and so on in the iron or any other gang and silicious matter and the iron bloom is sort of below and the tap slag flows on top so these pieces which you're seeing are broken pieces of tap slag and all of this indicates that there was extensive iron smelting activity going on here. But a series of heaps miles together spread in the forest particularly in Kalleda go to Lakshmi, Lakshmipuram this Kalleda Dasturabad, Bundagunam, Chittala, there are several villages in Adilabad. And this piece in fact shows typical flow structure of tap slag. It's a very this good tap quality slag. tap slag with the viscous texture, flow texture. One reason why so many of these sites of smelting have preserved is because they are in the reserve forest area. What we noted of course is that the areas where the refining of the wrought iron to form crucible steel or decarburization of cast iron which was being done at the crucible st uh, steel processing sites, a lot of those are in habitation areas and many have been practically destroyed. Still we can see this and we can record how much iron smelting was taking place and how much iron they produced in early days which was useful for the making of the woods as well as export from this place to European countries and uh, Central Asian countries. So normally at these production sites we rarely see evidence of the finished metal but we find a lot of archaeological debris like this. This is a specimen of a tuyer from this smelting site at Kalada in the forest area in northern Telangana and this would have been used as to fix the bag bellows with which to blow the air into the furnace and this part would have been embedded inside the furnace wall and the furnace linings which is why you see the slag all over this area and this portion shows you that it's made of thick terracotta pipe. <laughs> So it was all a very skilled process with numerous types of apparatus being made of very low-tech materials, terracotta and uh, crucibles made with impregnations of uh, carbonaceous materials and quartz-rich materials and different types of alluvial clays. And all of this was spread around this area along the banks of the Godavari here in these areas of Nizamabad and Adilabad. In, uh, entire area of northern Telangana. 
We get an idea of what the traditional furnaces and kilns may have looked like in this smithing furnace made of bricks in a Telangana village. One such slag heap remains at Konapuram as mute testimony to this legacy of wood steel production by crucible processes. Mandaloji Gangaram from Konapuram is one of the last surviving blacksmiths who has any recollection of forging implements of wood steel. Mandaloji Gangaram, Guru Konapuram. He says that his father shared his knowledge of smithing and that he started as an apprentice under his father. He made swords, various kinds of knives and axes as well since in those days battle axes were commissioned. This knowledge was passed on to him from his forefathers and he said that even his father would not have been able to match the skill of the legendary blacksmiths before his time. He also adds that his father only knew a part of what his predecessors knew. The use of the three janas or measurements and the making of the hilt. Significantly, he also mentions that the difference between iron and steel can be observed in the furnace where iron turns red in color while steel has a bluish appearance. In the remnants of the blacksmithy practices of the present, we catch some glimpses of the enormous skills of the past, the ways in which the iron tool is cut at red heat and sliced and shaped and hammered and made pliant in the hands of the master blacksmiths. Blacksmiths like Gangaram lived very close to the actual production of wood steel as seen at Konapuram. Hmm. We are at the Konapuram village in northern Telangana. Besides the remnants of the last few slag heaps related to this very rich tradition of crucible steel production and we've just visited one of the very few remaining blacksmiths or kamaris who are making who've had some first-hand experience with working with Woods implements. The point is that Woods being a high carbon steel of about 1.2 percent carbon um, has certain differences from iron in the sense that it is not forged at red heat as iron is, which our blacksmith was explaining, um, Mr. Gangaram, and it used to be forged at a lower heat because it has a different composition range of about 1.2 percent carbon. But then, as he was explaining, it could be used in, uh, it has certain properties of super plasticity, which was why it was forged to a very high extent, much more than iron could be forged and could be made to, used to make very thin implements. And as he was explaining, it could, even if it was bent, it would retain its shape. So it had all these extraordinary uh, properties. And uh, uh, Mr. Gangaram had been involved in making many kinds of implements, toddy tappers, knives, uh, swords. Although many of the slag heaps in production sites are disappearing, in this little village of Konapuram, you still see remnants of the slag heaps where you see the remains of the production of steel.
steel by crucible processes. Here you're looking at one of the bases or tops of the crucibles. You still see the streaks of rusted iron on it. And typically the wrought iron loom or the uh, would have been kept in the crucible and then heated to very high temperatures so that it was carburized to steel. Although the process that seems to have been used more widely here in the Telangana region was one where the cast iron was uh, added to wrought iron to get a steel of intermediate composition, that is a high carbon steel of about 1.5 or so percent carbon. And so all of these crucibles relate to relics of the crucible steel yeah. production. You see the bottoms of crucibles sometimes, this, is, this seems to be the lid, this seems to be the bottom, and there is an array of uh, uh, refractory materials here related to crucible steel production and slags and glassy and vitrified material here related to wood steel production. So although these are just very few remnants left, it gives an insight into this very um, extensive and rich production of high-grade steel in antiquity which was exported to different parts of the world from here. In the present day, the Kamari community, as represented by Bhimanna from Damanapet village, mainly forge agricultural implements and buffalo cart components. Bhimanna explains the range of tools that he uses in his smithy. <laughs> In the main, Bhimanna also tells us that he sharpens his knife by scraping it against a young sap tree. Although the agricultural implements are all made by men in Telangana as blacksmiths, they are actually extensively used by the women in the fields. Here is what the wife of the singing blacksmith, Sayanna of Damanapet, had to say. We are blacksmiths. My husband has dedicated himself to this profession. I have four sons and one daughter. But what my husband was earning as a blacksmith was insufficient. So I have been working in the fields over many years to raise the family. It is interesting that a toddy tapper's knife was found to be of wood steel, clearly showing a microstructure of hyperutectoid high carbon steel of 1.5% carbon with dark perlite alternating with cementite. The production of hyperutectoid steel by the crucible steel process was indicated by microstructural studies on crucible fragments from antiquity from a production site at Mel Sirvalur in Tamil Nadu. The fabled Damascus pattern was generated by forging the wood singot followed by etching, contrasting the dark perlite layers with light cementite. The swords could be forged to a very high extent due to the property of superplasticity 
or high forgeability at high temperatures. Mr. Rakesh Sharma, curator of the National Museum, explains the structure and the quality of Damascus steel blades made of wood steel. And you could see that the quality of this uh, uh, blade, this, the blade of this sword never, you know, treated, but this see the quality of this wood steel, that it has never corroded, it has never rusted, you know, and we have, ne uh, uh, we have never chemically treated. So, you can see that um, uh, for the last 400 years, the quality of this steel has been maintained itself. The Deccan Sultanate had a lot of interaction and trade with Persia and the Mughal regions, also in sword making techniques. Many derelict houses in Telangana bear evidence of this influence. This is the sword which belonged to the early Mughal period which we can say uh, 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 it was made during the period of the aqua. And here you can see the bottle marks very clearly, bottle marks on the blade, which show the excellent quality of the wood steel. And uh, the curvature in the blade, this was the feature of the Mughal uh, swords, that they have been find the curve, and it is a single edge blade, it is not a double sided, as blade, it is a single as blade, and uh, here you can see the um, hilt of this sword. It is um, beautifully decorated. You can see that this floral and creeper motifs are in golden. This is all in golden. This is one such dilapidated trader's house in Konasabudram, one of the hubs for the trade in wood steel, from where the wood singots were taken as far away as Persia. The ingots were taken across the Godavari to ports like Masulipatnam for maritime trade. But apart from technology, there is also a fascinating cultural dimension to the lives of the blacksmiths of the Telangana region. The worship of the patron goddess of the steel makers, Mamai, is a unique, continuing, intangible heritage of the region. Intriguingly, the blacksmith from Damanapet, Sayana, does not know anything of the worship of the Mamai, but remembers the song learned from his ancestors. This is the Mamai temple from Kona Samudram. Members of the Viswakarma community gather at the Mamai temple to worship the goddess. Ceremonies are conducted by the priest who is also from the Viswakarma community. Although not part of the mainstream Brahmanic order, the Vishwakarma community regard themselves as having a status equal to the Brahmins and often sport the sacred thread as seen amongst the Kamari community of Telangana. In the 
ఐదు కమ్యూనిటీలు ఉన్నాయండి నాలుగు కమ్యూనిటీలు పనిచేస్తారు ఒకటి ఉక్కు పనిచేసిన వాళ్ళు కమరులు అలాగే ఈ ఇత్తడి ఇత్తడి పనిచేసిన వాళ్ళు కంచరి వాళ్ళు రెండవది గోల్డ్ పనిచేసిన వాళ్ళు అవసరం వాళ్ళు నెక్స్ట్ ఈ కట్టే పని చేసిన వాళ్ళు వడ్ల వాళ్ళు నాలుగు రకాల మనుషులు ఇక్కడికి వచ్చి పూజలో పాల్గొంటారు వాళ్ళ లెక్క తక్కువ ఏం లేకుండా అందరూ ఒకటే లెక్క పాల్గొంటారు అందులో ఈ ఉక్కు పని చేసిన వాళ్ళు పెద్దవాళ్ళు ఈ ఇత్తడి పని చేసిన వాళ్ళు కంచెల వాళ్ళు రెండవ వాళ్ళు వడ్ల పని చేసిన వాళ్ళు మూడవ వాళ్ళు అవసర పని చేసిన వాళ్ళు నాలుగవ వాళ్ళు ఇట్లా అందరూ ఇక్కడికి వచ్చి పూజలో పాల్గొంటారు దేవికి నైవేద్యం ఉండి ఒక బొద్దుతో నుండి మధ్యాహ్నం పూట పూ ఇంటికి తీసుకుపోయి వాళ్ళ పనిముట్లకు పూజ చేసి అప్పుడు ఉపవాసం ఒక బొద్దు అయిపోతుంది The mention of place names from Tamil Nadu in the songs of the blacksmiths such as Mailapur and Kanchipuram point to intriguing connections whereby the Telangana Mamai cult may be linked to Kamakshi, the patron goddess of the Kamalar in Tamil Nadu. The goddess Kamakshi was worshipped by the Kamalar community of artisans of Tamil Nadu and Kerala who were also organized as part of a five-fold grouping of artisans akin to the Vishwakarma. In Tamil Nadu, apart from the mainstream Hinduistic practices of the Vishwakarma traditions, there are also blacksmithy and iron smelting practices which were followed by tribal communities which may well predate the other traditions and provide a missing link to the megalithic iron traditions. For example, the Kothas of the Nilgiris are a prominent group who practice blacksmithy, who live amidst megalithic cairns, stone circles and menhirs. I'm standing here in front of the blacksmith village here in Kolimalai and it's very interesting uh, this whole area it seems to be one that's part of an ancient landscape which has been integrated so well into the life of this tribal settlement you see here what seems to be a line of menhirs or perhaps a, a stone uh, menhirs going back to uh, megalithic times perhaps because we know that there were a lot of cairns here in this region and then as we move along we see here the temples of the kotas temple for ayanur and amanur and right behind also quite interestingly is a, a pillar which is set amidst some of these stones the part of a cairn uh, sort of context and then we see some more three stones marking out the furthest boundary and these do have a significance as i was talking to some of the villagers they were saying that although the men are allowed to lean against it uh, the women are not when i was about to sit down and so on so obviously this has some sort of very ancient significance in terms of the landscape and the uh, the natural setting and the interplay between the built environment and the uh, the setting for their activities which goes back a very long way as we see with the blacksmithy from their own accounts of it amongst the kotas there is an interesting differentiation of labor whereby the men are blacksmiths and the women are potters
This is uh, Mr. Raman, who's a Korean, who's a blacksmith, traditional blacksmith. And uh, Sri Shiva Kumar here is a Pujari or uh, the priest of the local temple. the Kota priest is concerned about the decline of blacksmithy and wants to revive it and has himself trained in blacksmithy. Both the Telangana and Kota blacksmiths said that the women did not partake of blacksmithy because it was a very risky profession dealing with fire. The Kota blacksmiths, like the blacksmiths of Telangana, followed a barter system of exchange where they exchange their agricultural implements with their other communities, such as the Todas of the Nilgiris. These are some of the agricultural implements that the Kotas forged. In the past, the Kotas did their own smelting, bringing iron ore from the top of the hills. Tamil Nadu has also revealed significant evidence for high carbon crucible steel production such as from megalithic Kodumanal. From the early historic site of Patanam, evidence for high carbon wood steel production was found, which may have been traded from the Indo-Roman port of Muziris to the Roman world, from the region of the Ceres, which may be linked to the Chera kingdom as per Roman accounts. Indeed, the Sangamera Bardic poems of the poetess Avayar of the early historic period evoked the battles with spears by warring chieftains such as Anchi, with the spears referred to as Ekku, which may be related to the word for steel Ukku. The Kotas may be an isolated example, but the cultic practices of the plains of Tamil Nadu seem to have influenced the blacksmiths and Vishwakarma of the Telangana as seen in the songs which refer to Tamil places and temples such as at Mailapur and Kanchipuram. In that sense, the reinforcing of cultic links between the Telangana and Tamil regions where wood steel making was practiced is an interesting finding suggesting a long-standing tradition. One of the important cultic aspects of the Vishwakarma community in Telangana is the worship of Veera Brahmendra Swami who is worshipped as a patron saint of the blacksmiths. This practice is said to have emerged from the Kadapa region, now in Andhra Pradesh. Evidence of syncretism is seen in the depiction of his devotee, Siddhappa, who wears the Mohammedan-inspired Kulai. At the festival of Ugadi, or New Year in Telangana, Many of the implements are kept in his shrine for worship. Significantly, these days the implements include 
both iron and carpentry tools since many blacksmiths have now also become carpenters. As indicated by Gangaram switching to carpentry, it is indeed poignant that the blacksmiths who were considered the eldest amongst the Vishwakarma have seen their influence wane and their livelihoods greatly marginalized with the rise of industrialized agriculture and commodification of luxury goods. Mr. Adi Moolam Lakshminachari of Rangaredi district of Telangana has been forging agricultural implements and bullock cart parts. His smithy consists of a brick kiln with blowers and he has an iron anvil which he uses for smithing which is shaped in a cubicle form. The great woods making traditions and iron smelting traditions such as of the Agarya of Central India also declined due to the Industrial Revolution. While the British destroyed several armories of wood steel following the mutiny of 1857. The indigenous iron and steel technology of India declined considerably under British domination. For example, the Indian Forest Act in 1927 under the British Crown effectively led to several of the Uku Kamari or iron smelters of the Telangana losing their places where they practice smelting and thus their livelihoods. The iron community smelters, particularly they are called as Muddha Kamari in this region, total. So there are several villages existing with the Muddha Kamari people. Now they switched over to agriculture works and simultaneously... So when you they say Muddha Kamari, yeah. they were actually only doing yeah. iron smelting? Iron smelting. Mm -hmm. Not this the smithy is very processes. wonderful site. We have crucible site as well as smelting site. This and is how close old crucible site. This is yeah. how close were the Mudakamari communities living? Because very near, there is a Lakshmipuram. There are several uh, families 
still there. And here in uh, Kaleda, they shifted to Dasparabad. Dasparabad, there are 300 families now living. But they Gunda don't have Gunda. any memory now of iron smelting? Or Simply they tell uh, yesterday, eyes that uh, smelled, uh, Smith told us, these people also do the same thing because they stopped lying back and they did not uh, start it smelting. The forgotten almost is a forgotten chapter in their life. Yeah. Only this uh, the simple memory they have, the old people they reveal that how they were blasting, how they were making iron for uh, blasting hours, they differ from four, and four hours to eight hours and the furnace was constructed and used for only twice or thrice they used to remove and they used to reconstruct a new furnace and billows they were used the buffalo billows very big one because it needs huge huge amount of, draft. amount of air as well as blasting time also it reduces ఏడేడు బద్దలు బవరంబిలు బల తుర్తిగా దాపార కలియు మందు నా కమ్మరి ఆచార్య గరిగనే మనకు బ్రహ్మ కై మూర్తులకు పరమ గురుతుడైన పరిగంగారా భూరి బవరాంబకు మాయిరే మాయిరే మమ్మగన్న తల్లిరే మమ్మాయిరే నీవు అనుకరకు గజ్జలు కనుక పాపెడబట్టు అందులేనే మా ఇంటి అమ్మవారుకు చేతు జయమంగళం a huge amount of work was done here there was a huge heap from along that across that road about 10 to 15 feet height was gradually they are removing all the debris and using for the filling of the ditches in the villages and the using for uh, cross canals and everything so this is a last tradition regrettably the pioneering role of Indian blacksmiths and smelters in the history of steel metallurgy remains relatively unrecognized. And so it seems that though the last vestiges and memories of a great pre-industrial tradition have all but faded away from the lives of the blacksmiths, the ukukamari, the woods makers, what still lingers are the powerful songs to Mamai, their patron goddess of steel. <laughs> 